Funding for the production of Folks is provided in part by the Friends of LPB. It has been proven now wherever there's a minority bank, minority enterprise will grow. And I think we've seen it since 1972, the growth of minority enterprise here in our city extended out throughout the state of Louisiana as well. When other uh, business and professional people throughout the South, and as, for that matter, throughout the United States, found out that we could do it, well, they decided that maybe we can do it too. And uh, since that time, uh, we have had two other black-controlled savings and loan associations to open in Louisiana. Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Hinton. And I'm Genevieve Stewart. Today on Folks, we'll be taking a look at minority-owned financial institutions. We'll be focusing on two in particular, Liberty Bank in New Orleans and First Federal Savings and Loan in Baton Rouge. We'll also be talking with two members of the Federal Reserve System. That and more today on Folks. Everybody's just folks. Today on Folks, we'll be visiting First Federal Savings and Loan in Baton Rouge as we turn our attention to minority-owned financial institutions. We'll be telling you about the role they play in Louisiana's financial community and how they help black neighborhoods. Now later on in the program, Rob will be telling us about First Federal. But first, we'd like to turn our attention to one of the state's leading minority-owned banks. That's Liberty Bank in New Orleans. Ten years ago, Liberty Bank in New Orleans opened its doors with a handful of employees and garnered $2 million in deposits, a modest sum by banking standards. Experiencing a growth rate of 20% per year, Liberty now boasts $50 million in total assets from 15,000 depositors. A minority bank was obviously an idea whose time had come, as bank president Alden McDonald explained. It has been proven now wherever there's a minority bank, minority enterprise, will grow. And I think we've seen it since 1972, the growth of minority enterprise here in our city extended out throughout the state of Louisiana as well. Minority banking really got started in the 1870s uh, with the Freeman's Bank um, out of the north. Uh, they had 37 branches around the United States with one branch really being located here in the New Orleans area. Uh, through history, the banks started falling off uh, one by one, not only minority banks, but uh, majority banks as well. And when you look at that period of time, the 1880s, and we're in the 1980s now, it's very interesting to note uh, history repeating itself. Even during that period of time, you had 119 black legislators in the state of Louisiana. You had three black lieutenant governors. You had a uh, black that was secretary of um, education for the state of Louisiana. Uh, uh, the treasurer for the state of Louisiana was black during that period of time. And you had a lot of black entrepreneurship. They had owners of cotton mills and steamship companies. And that's what minority banking could do today. Could do the same thing it did back in the 1880s. And I think it's very important for people to realize that a minority bank may be a small bank, but the amount of uh, participation it can cause a community is uh, unthinkable. Liberty Bank is a member of the National Bankers Association. The MBA is the trade organization representing the nation's 100 minority-owned banks. By networking within the association and using the leverage of their combined $4 billion assets, 
locally owned minority banks are then placed in a very advantageous position. Alden McDonald is also president of the National Bankers Association. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as a large bank because we're really part of the National Bankers Association, which is made up of some 100 plus banks all around the country, representing employment force in excess of 5,000, representing over a million and a half depositors with total resources of some $4 billion. So we're not really a small bank in the sense of what Liberty Bank's size is because we draw on the resources of our associates in other parts of the country. And this is why we're able to serve corporate America. Corporate America views us as a $4 billion institution and not a small $50 million bank. What is the NBA stance on attracting large white corporate depositors? The purpose of the NBA is to collectively sell the National Bankers Association and the minority banking community. The National Banking Association and the Corporate Advisory Board will encourage other Fortune 500 companies to do the same. And the reason the, the big push or the big support from Corporate America is that Corporate America has found out that it's really good business to do business with minority banks. It completes an economic cycle that doesn't exist normally in our communities. And if you take the balance of trade with foreign countries, it's necessary to have that trade go back to that community or go back to that country in order to keep the country economically viable. Well, the same theory holds true on the domestic side. If you continue to take the resources from the minority community and not find a vehicle to put it back into the minority community, eventually that community is going to die economically. In 1983 alone, the NBA made presentations reaching 250 major corporate treasurers. McDonald says, at present, 200 of the Fortune 500 companies are conducting business with minority banks. Uh, to give you an example, Aetna Life Insurance Company, we're a lead bank for one of their lines of credits. And uh, in our line of credit, uh, we service some 42 other minority banks out of that line of credit. That will have Aetna to only do business or deal with one bank, but yet have a relationship with 42 other banks around the country. So it's been working. Uh, it's good for minority banks. It's good for corporate America. And it's good for America, because that's what we're all about, keeping the entire system economically viable. In the past two years, the total spectrum of banking has changed with deregulations. You now have brokerage firms and savings and loans who are conducting some limited banking services. What do you foresee in the future this will mean to the black banking industry? The minority banking community throughout the country should be at somewhat of a competitive edge. And the reason for that is because we've been really servicing a niche in the marketplace that now the non minority banks are attempting to get. And once you have the niche in the marketplace and you service them well and you keep up with changing times, you should survive. Liberty Bank now has three attractive branches. Its 72 employees are well trained to operate the bank's top-notch equipment. Liberty, like other minority banks, has created a progressive business environment which in turn supports the financial development of minority communities that were traditionally stagnant segments of the economy. That's part of Liberty's success. Our success is really from the people in our community. The people in our community have supported us tremendously over the 10 years. And I think on the other hand, Liberty has given back tenfold what the community has given to us. So it's a combination of those two things where the bank uh, supports the community and the community supports the bank and the people in our community has been uh, uh, tremendous with the support that they've given us over the 10 years that we've been in, the, in business. The building you see behind me was once First Federal Savings and Loan of Scotlandville. The man who was probably most responsible for First Federal's existence was the late Dr. Felton Clark. You see back in the early 50s Dr. Clark who was president of Southern University at the time felt blacks weren't getting their fair share of the housing market. After meeting with a group of business and professional leaders in the Baton Rouge area, it was decided that a black-controlled savings and loan would be the best thing for the black community. Hence, on November 1st, 1956, after a lot of discussion, research, and red tape, 
first federal savings and loan open its doors. ...and subscriptions from the community. That's $291,000, representing about 1,200 customers. Now, back in those early days, the largest sum of money First Federal could lend was $15,000. But today, First Federal's assets total better than $50 million, and it has become a pillar of strength to the black community in Baton Rouge. If it had not been for us, many people would not have been able to have homes, uh, to have businesses. Uh, you can think back 27 years ago, uh, you could probably come up with one or two subdivisions for black people. Now they're scattered throughout the city of Baton Rouge, the parish of East Baton Rouge, and First Federal had a lot to do with that. The first black savings and loan was established 93 years ago, yet First Federal Savings and Loan of Scotlandville was the first black-owned savings and loan in Louisiana and the Deep South. Other uh, business and professional people throughout the South, and for that matter, throughout the United States, found out that we could do it, well, they decided that maybe we can do it too. And uh, since that time, uh, we have had two other black-controlled savings and loan associations to open in Louisiana, in the state of Louisiana. One is um, a savings and loan that opened about 1963 down in New Orleans that's called United Federal, and one that just opened on the 10th of this month, had a grand opening on the 10th of this month by you federal. So there are three of us in, in the state of Louisiana right now. Not only is First Federal the first black savings and loan in the Deep South, but it is also one of the largest in the country. We have grown to be the seventh largest black controlled financial institution, not financial institution, the seventh black controlled savings and loan association in the United States. Now we're talking about Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., large cities. And we are right here just off of Southern University's campus. And we are number seven, and we're quite proud of that fact. And where First Federal has seen a lot of success, like many of us, it has also experienced some pretty tough years. We had to start off behind. So <clears throat> when times got hard, uh, and many of the savings and loan associations just could not make it because the economy got completely out of control. At one time, and that hasn't been over two years ago, interest rates went up to as much as 21%. Uh, not only black people, but many families throughout the United States were priced out of the housing market. There were just families who could not get housing. And not only that, but many of the associations had to do one of two things. Because their bottom line was beginning to get red, and red, and red, and red. Many of them had to either merge with other associations that were strong, or they had to just go out of business. I'm happy to say that First Federal was able to, to weather that storm, and uh, we feel that we are financially sound and that we will continue to be financially sound. Tell us why someone should put their money in black-owned or controlled uh, savings and loans such as First Federal. Number one, we, 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 we are proud of the fact that, that we say we are black. But number two, and the most important thing about it, is that we can do just as much for anybody, white or black, in the savings and loan business as anybody else can. We have the same $100,000 worth of federal insurance that all other savings and loan associations have. We think we have good management. In fact, um, uh, just about every day someone tells us that uh, we are proud to be a part of First Federal. And uh, I can proudly say that 27 years after, we've, after we got started, we have at least 40% of our depositors uh, are, are white, believe it or not because they're coming where they can get good service. Uh, they're coming where they're just not a number, but they are named, and, and, and we give them real service. And we believe that when you have good people with a good organization and you give good service, that's the key to success. And we feel that we have reached that, but that we have found that key. How does the community benefit from your institution? The, communi the community benefits tremendously because, as you know, <clears throat> Uh, looking back over our economics, uh, we are told that the dollar rolls over seven times uh, in the community. And you, when you think about a $50 million association, and when you think about the number of construction loans that we have had throughout, throughout the community, and the amount of money that was placed there, 
and you take those dollars and you roll them over seven times, you can see how it has helped the community economically as, as well as financially. Are your investments primarily in the black community? Primarily when we first started it was. Right now, as I say, we have grown to a point and we believe that the economy has gotten to a point of where uh, the financial institution's money is not looked at as black money or white money, but green money. And uh, we feel that the entire community, as long as we can render a service, uh, that we are, we, are get, we are getting our fair share, I put it like that, we are getting our fair share of the money uh, from the majority as well as the minority community. Uh, we started off to help the black community or the minority community, we are still doing that. But we have spread it since then. And that's, that is the reason we believe that our success has been so good because we have not just concentrated in the black community, even though we have not lost our sights on helping the black community get housing uh, throughout, but we are also helping the entire community. And uh, we, 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 we feel quite fortunate about that. What does the future hold for First Federal? I, the future for First Federal, uh, particularly First Federal, I think we are, we are in a very unique position uh, because right here in the Scotlandville area, we're just off of Southern University's campus. There's quite a payroll up there. Uh, to the south of us is LSU. There's quite a payroll there. We have petrochemical plants up and down the, the Mississippi River. Uh, I think we're in a unique city, in a unique position, and I see nothing but face federal continuing to move. We now shift our attention to the Federal Reserve System, the central banking system of this country. The Federal Reserve works closely with the U.S. Treasury Department and other federal agencies to help establish money and banking conditions that will best suit the economic growth of the country. Now there are 12 districts that make up the Federal Reserve System. The district which Louisiana is a part of is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Two Louisianians who are members of the Atlanta District Governing Body are here with us today to talk about the Federal Reserve System. They are Horatio Thompson, and Dr. Roosevelt Steptoe. Gentlemen, welcome to folks. Thank you. In your capacities with the Federal Reserve Board, your recommendations help to ultimately set the interest rates for Louisiana banks. That's a tremendous responsibility. Do you ever feel torn in that your decisions will ultimately help the economy as a whole, but may not be in the best interest of minorities in the immediate situation? Dr. Steptoe. Yes, well, one does have his own philosophical orientation, but one has to realize that the Federal Reserve System is concerned with monetary policy, which reflects itself in terms of the rate of interest. And there does seem to be a conflict sometimes between the rate of interest and the rate of unemployment. So I do tend to worry about the rate of unemployment being high at the same time the Federal Reserve System uh, focuses on the uh, interest rate and raising the rate of interest so that uh, there may be more unemployment in the system than we would desire, but because their responsibility has to do with controlling the uh, rate of interest, I think that they pursue that and hope that some other policy, fiscal policy, will put more people back to work. Mr. Thompson. Yes, uh, we, we're concerned with, with the whole economy. And of course, uh, the way, uh, actually, we don't set the interest rate. I think that should be made clear that uh, the uh, interest, uh, we set the interest that's charged to the member banks, the discount window, that we loan the money to the banks. And of course, ultimately, that rate gets down to the consumer. And of course, it's two or three points higher when it gets down to the consumer. And uh, I'm concerned, I know Dr. Steptoe is always concerned, how it's going to affect uh, minority groups. But we, uh, not only do we represent minorities, we also represent business, labor, and, and uh, the consumer. And we have to think of how it's going to affect the overall economy. Higher interest rates help to control spiraling inflation. Um, but this tightened the money market and caused many minorities to be laid off. Consequently, some civil rights leaders feel that the economy was brought under control at the expense of minorities. How do you react to this? Well, I think that the economy was brought under control at the, uh, well, which caused some sacrifice on the part of all Americans, minorities included. It just so happened that uh, I think that a greater proportion of the minority population did suffer unemployment. And that is the price that uh, we had to pay because of the kinds of policies we pursued. 
But that seems to be true no matter which way the economy moves, uh, that, that there are more minorities uh, in the unemployment ranks. And of course, it goes even farther than that. Uh, when we hear these reports in Atlanta of closed down in factories, the businesses, bankruptcies, high bankruptcies are higher than they've ever been, which means it's not only minorities, businesses, uh, real estate people, all of them are suffering. We take our share of it, but it's it generally uh, always it's a large group of us that are complaining about how interest rates affects our, affect our livelihoods. Currently, the Louisiana prime interest rate at banks is 11.5%. What's ahead for interest rates in the future? Well, if we had to make predictions, uh, I would say that uh, we will be in possibly for a slight increase in the next two, three months, and then gradually, I think the interest rates will go down again. That's, that's the way most of us feel in the Federal Reserve System. We are, we are very concerned about the high deficit that we have in the government, and we're hoping that that will be brought under control. Mr. Volcker has just consistently stated that that's one of his main objectives is to bring down this government deficit. He preaches that every time he appears before congressional committees. And Paul Volcker is the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, the whole right. entire governing body. That's right. If the interest rates go up, Dr. Steptoe, how will this affect unemployment? Well, I tend to think, and I think uh, history will prove me correct, that uh, as the uh, rates of interest go up, uh, it, it tends to affect certain industries more than others, such as the construction industry and uh, other industries. And we tend to have a decrease in activities in those industries. And that means that unemployment in those industries would tend to uh, go up. So that uh, I expect the rate of interest to, um, just as Mr. Thompson said, to s go up slightly over the next six or seven months, level off, and then begin to come down. And I believe that uh, we can do that without any significant increase in the unemployment rate because of the confidence that people have now in the economy. They believe it's going to move forward and plant and uh, uh, businessmen will begin to expand. About 40 percent of the welfare and food stamp recipients are minorities. These programs have been severely cut in recent years due to the deficit spending you mentioned earlier. Can social program spending be reinstituted to its previous levels and the economy continue to strengthen? Well, strangely, if the economy continues to strengthen, I believe that that is the greatest possibility for these social programs to be reinstituted and, uh, in, and expanded upon because uh, federal revenues were falling as the economy moves into a recession. And as it moves into a recovery period, revenues will increase and therefore we won't have that uh, conflict between guns and butter. I think we can have more of both. So I think that we could have more social programs and reduce the deficit if the economy continues to move to full employment. Of course, you know, on your, on your Social Security program in particular, it's been revamped and reorganized, and there's hopes that uh, with the new reorganization that we can generate more revenue, because it's actually just about to go bankrupt, see? And uh, just as Dr. Steptoe said, with increased revenues, possibly they can uh, increase the social programs. Of course, my interest is, uh, is in actually getting more people back to work. And, I just feel that this, all of this uh, help that we give people, it doesn't uh, it really, to me, it, it's more degrading than anything else. I must prefer people to get back to work and, and earn their living rather than get help and uh, welfare. Mm. Now, maybe that sounds a lot conservative to you, but... <laughs> no, it's, no, it certainly doesn't. Mm. It, it well, sounds like you are mm. a very concerned mm. member of the Federal Reserve, and that's good to hear. Mm. On the world monetary market, the dollar is stronger now than it has ever been in recent years. And that's wonderful. But how does that translate into everyday bread and butter economics for the average American family? Well, let me just say that um, we have several sectors in this economy that are dependent upon exports in order to uh, maintain its level of uh, output and employment. And a strengthened dollar means that our goods and services here cost more overseas, and that will decrease our exports. 
and uh, which means then that uh, such industries as the agricultural industry, depending upon uh, exports, will have to reduce its uh, output somewhat. So that that tends to uh, translate into fewer jobs for Americans. And uh, of course, there are some benefits, but in terms of uh, the way I think it, it affects the overall economy, it would mean uh, fewer jobs overseas. I mean, for us at home. For the average viewer looking in, what can they do personally to help the economy improve? Mr. Thompson? That's a hard question. The average viewer. Well, would you say it's buying American-made products? Well, yeah. that is one thing, but Saving one, money? Of the, one, of the, one of the things that I think that we have to be concerned about as Americans is productivity. One thing that everyone can do is to be sure that whatever he does, he does it the best, so that the, because the quality of our output affects the uh, purchase of those goods overseas and also the productivity, the amount of goods and services we produce per hour, per day, per week, per person, uh, affects the price of those goods overseas. So one of the reasons why we're having so much difficulty selling our goods overseas is because of the high price of them. And some people relate that to the cost of those goods at home and the cost of, them, of these goods would be affected by the productivity per person. So the quality and the price of those goods can be determined to some extent by what we as Americans put into those goods and services as we produce them. Our program for this week, thanks for watching. Next week on Folks, we'll be taking a look at why our children can't read and the increasing prominence of vocational education. We hope you'll join us then. Until next time, so long. <laughs>